The Tom Woods Show, episode 1113. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, everybody. Big news. We have just announced the details of the Contra Cruise for 2018. That's right. This is the Liberty event of the year that Bob Murphy and I co-host. It's a seven-day cruise. It is the most fun you can possibly imagine. Plenty of special guests to be announced in the coming days and weeks, but comedian and podcaster Dave Smith will be joining us once again on the Contra Cruise, which this year is taking place along the Mexican Riviera, October 21st through 28th, 2018. Check it out at ContraCruise.com. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. Last week I was in New York City, and of course... I visited Michael Malice. What else am I going to do while I'm there? And in fact, I had a chance to appear for a second time, the first person ever to do that, to be a two-time guest on Your Welcome with Michael Malice over on compoundmedia.com. And what I've done for this episode of The Tom Woods Show is I've taken that episode of Michael's show, which was just great. You're just going to love it, I hope. And I pulled it out from behind the paywall, which you would normally have to scale in order to get access to this episode. So now you can listen to it for free. Before we get to that, let me take a minute to introduce you to a website created by a Tom Wood Show listener that I think you might like. And it's called MiracleOfMatcha.com, M-A-T-C-H-A.com. And the woman who started it says... Matcha green tea has been used for centuries in Japan and China. It's different from other types of tea in that it's not strained out before consuming. You'll actually be consuming the entire leaf, making matcha more potent than other tea varieties. It has many health benefits, which she talks about, of course, in what else? A free ebook on the subject. She has other free ebooks as well The Quick Start Weight Loss Handbook, No Excuses Body Weight Strength Challenge, Eating for a Healthy Life and an introductory guide to matcha smoothies with recipes. Lots of great stuff over at miracleofmatcha.com. Miracleofmatcha, M-A-T-C-H-A.com. So go check that out. I'm going to link to it at tomwoods.com slash 1113. And remember, you want to get nice little publicity for your brand new site. Well, make sure and get your hosting through my link, and I'll give you some really great bonuses, including a burst of traffic through nice publicity like this. All right. Let us turn our attention to your welcome with Michael Malice. My 13-year-old daughter, Veronica, was our one-person audience. There really isn't an in-studio audience for the show, but she was there, and Michael was saying things that made her want to burst out laughing, but she was afraid that would ruin the show. And, of course, it would have made the show even better, but I understand why she wanted to stay quiet. But anyway, hope you enjoy. Here we go. Tom, I'm not going to do a monologue. Welcome. Thanks, Michael. I will do one thing, which is before you caught here today, uh, and I'm finally almost done with this chest congestion, which I got visiting Orlando. Uh, I, whenever I get in a flight, this happens. Yeah. Is you get the same thing? Sometimes, yeah. It's it's maddening because I don't. I feel fine, but I sound. So the question I said was: Tweet me any questions you would like me to ask Tom Woods. Don't be the cretin who tags him in your reply. Now, one person did in a funny way. Because he said, why are libertarians such contrarians at Tom Woods? That was funny. He still got blocked, but it was funny. <laughs> okay. The other guy just wrote, who is Tom Woods at Thomas E. Woods? And I'm like, what, is, what are you trying to do here? But we've got a lot of questions. I know you don't like direct interaction with the audience because they're <laughs> what are you talking because about? the masses are beneath us. I'm the guy who had the 1,000th episode with the 600 people. Remember that? That was last year. Yeah, that was like yeah, I know. That's so 2017. That's right. This is 2018. Well, New Year's different. resolution is not to talk to anybody this year. <laughs> yes. So we got a bunch of really, really good questions, um, and the first one. Uh, is from Kevin Goodsman, who I had... Why are you rolling well, your eyes? What, what is this? This is your life? Kevin Goodsman and I wrote a book together. That's, uh, Kevin Goodsman is a great guy, very funny. Uh, on, I, know, I know he's a great guy. I don't you know there's books. other people listening to this, right? <laughs> so I'm explaining to them that Kevin Goodsman is a great guy. He's a Jeffersonian, Jefferson historian. He wrote a book recently about Madison, which is very worth checking out. Is that okay that I explain who Je- Kevin That's Goodsman super. is? Yeah. Okay. And his question was, boxers or briefs? Oh, get out of town. I'm not making this up. Well, I think boxers are extremely uncomfortable, so forget that. But really what you need are Tommy John's underwear, because Tommy John's... Those boxer briefs? 
they're kind of like boxer briefs. Okay. And they're extremely comfortable okay. and luxurious. And so it's you get to a point as a man when you decide I'm going to spend more than a buck a pair. Yep. You know, that's that's a good great answer. Um, what is an aspect of anarchism? This is from Warren, who's a great guy. What is an aspect of anarchism you struggle with the most, considering you're that you're social conservative? Oh, from that angle. So it's not the who would be in control of the nuclear weapons question. Right. (laughs) We'll solve that one later. Uh, I don't know. I I guess abortion's a tough one. Yeah. It's it's not like I can't imagine how it would work. But on the other hand, I can't imagine how the situation could be worse than it is now. And I think. Sure, you can. Mandatory abortion. Well, like in in China. That's true. But I guess my point would be that, uh, you know, in Ancapistan, there isn't going to be mandatory abortion. That, That I know. But. You don't know that. You could have covenants where people have well, okay, covenants. population control. So the, but, that's, but that's the thing. I think in this situation, because people wouldn't have a political center to right. go to to petition and waste all their time and money and fundraise to elect politicians who don't do anything, I think you'd get a lot of people who say, well, let's work practically. Let's open crisis pregnancy centers. Sure. Let's do what we can to help people. And that's, those are practical, immediate things that have practical, immediate consequences. And if people focus more on that, which they would have to in that kind of yes. environment, maybe, so maybe I'm talking myself into why this isn't such a bad problem after all. You, I, I know you're, you're loath to criticize Rothbard, understandably, because he gets so much unfair criticism. But do you agree with me that his whole reasoning about how you could have a pro-life scenario in an anarchist society is not really very effective? It seemed like he was trying to fit a square into a round hole. Well, I don't know. I don't know what he had to say about that. I know that he was uh, in, in favor of abortion in, in in some of his works, but that toward the end of his life, particularly with his involvement with the Buchanan campaign, right. he started to talk about being willing to make re- reasonable restrictions on abortion. But I don't know that he ever had a full blown. No, I think his whole that. scenario thought thought experiment was like, well, you can pay the woman to have the kid. And blah 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 blah, and it's like yeah, maybe this, you could work it out in some kind of a but, market arrangement. Right, but it, this is not. If, I don't think this is really getting him or getting a pro-life person to the end that they want, because once you start haggling about the price of killing, it, I, I mean, yeah, it's, yeah, no, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. So, so I'm not sure about how that would work. Um, <laughs> this is a good one. Are you aware of Maxine Bernier? No, I thought you were going to say Maxine Waters. Are you familiar with that? Been, yes. Are you familiar with that Twitter account? No, I'm not. There's a fake Maxine Waters Twitter account. Oh, oh, that? Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. It's, oh it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, here's an easy question that I know the answer to. Okay. Who is the bigger villain, FDR or Wilson? Well, I know your, your answer would be Wilson. What would be your answer? That's uh, hard to say. I mean, I, I, no, wait, hold on a minute. Wait a minute. Wow. Wait, wait, wait. wait. I'll let explain me, why. Let me make the case. Easy. Okay. Okay, but let me make the case. Cast one more before you make the case. Who do you think was more of an ideologue? Oh, Wilson was more of an ideologue. Okay, yeah. that's my. Point. I mean, <laughs> there's no way a Princeton professor is not going to be an ideologue. Right. That's whereas, my point. whereas some guy who was on Wall Street and this and that, right. I mean, he, he's probably willing to give and take, and he's a hodgepodge of right. views, and you don't know what he's going to think. Correct. I mean, you elect Wilson, you pretty much know what you're getting. And if you thought he was going to keep us out of war, you're, you're not really paying attention right. to what he's saying. But whereas with FDR, genuinely, you could have thought he was going to balance the budget. Yep. His, his VP was saying that Hoover was driving us down the road to socialism. So hard to know what you're going to get with him. But the thing is you have not only the intervention into the economy uh, and the New Deal that wound up leaving unemployment in the double digits all through the decade, but you do have the internment of the Japanese. You, sure. have, all, you have civil liberties outrages. You definitely have – You have civil liberties outrages under Wilson too. Well, that's you. definitely true. Yeah, that's true. I mean under Wilson, it's – certainly during wartime, it was worse under Wilson than under wartime it was uh, – than, than it was yeah. under – I mean on the other even, hand – spe- Even though the villains under FDR were much worse than the villains that's under true, Wilson. That's true, and I think – but that's probably why people – were, it was easier to persuade them of that war than it was World War One. Right. So you had to really propagandize right. them, yes. put them in jail, and yeah, yeah. draft them. Um, you know, but I guess you did draft them in World War Two as well. But it was World War Two was barely a draft. The, the lines were out the, after Pearl Harbor. It's it's only right. technically a draft. In a People sense. could see, yeah. Whereas with the World War One case, you had to really, right. really stretch to say that this was a real threat to the U.S. But it just seems like there's. Everybody goes back and points to the experience of the 30s to show that – I mean there were – I even saw a textbook. Somebody posted my private Facebook group facing pages of a textbook aimed at homeschoolers 
aimed at homeschoolers that says, well, we had this terrible economic downturn, then Franklin Roosevelt came along and the economy improved, and he showed what could be done when the government get... I mean, so now everybody, that's the do you know where that? Do you know why that homeschooling book's like that? I would bet money. Because in order to make Reagan a demigod, you have to defend Reagan's veneration of FDR. Well, that's certainly... I bet you that's the logic there. Could be. Could be. Could also be most people who write textbooks, especially for homeschoolers, they just look at what the existing textbooks Wikipedia. say. Wikipedia. And they just <laughs> yeah. ape them. So what's your... But I, I, I can't even wrap my head around how you think they're comparable, especially because before FDR got into office, we are on the verge of a revolution. Like, it very easily could have been some kind of socialist coup. You had the, uh, the what was, was that army that was marching on? Oh, uh, the bonus army? Bonus army. People were ready to install a, a fascist dictator, which they basically kind of did. Have you seen that debate where someone's arguing that it's FDR that preserved some modicum of free enterprise? Yeah, I've heard that, but that's kind of the that's kind of the mainstream textbooky left version. Sure, he saved capitalism, but in an extremely strained way. Yeah, he so prevented Wilson, us from having the means of production being government owned. Yeah, I guess I, you're shrugging your shoulders at this. Oh, oops, I it's kind of a big deal. I don't, I don't think communism, other than through like Russian agents was ever nearly the popular movement in the U.S. I agree with you. Europe. I agree with you. But if you look at, if it wasn't for Wilson, you wouldn't have had Lenin. Yeah, that's true. So, so in other words, big deal. Consequ- okay. I, I would say that the unintended consequences of what Wilson did, because I don't think he wanted Lenin, and I don't think he wanted I, I think he did. the Nazis. I think the left are like, all right, let's have someone try this out and see maybe it works. Really? You think so? That about Will- I think that about some of the left uh, at the time. I mean, how else can you account for that idiot Lincoln Steffens going over there and saying, I have been over into the future and it works? Right. What kind of a... I don't think Wilson was on that level. I think that's just a dumb... I, I don't think he was on that level, but I can even I can appreciate this. This idea is bubbling around in academia. Someone's trying it out. It's like, you know what? Let's actually put the metal to the put the pedal to the metal and see what if this does work, because what we have isn't clearly isn't working. I don't, but there there was much less of a what we have clearly isn't working in the '30s than there was in Wilson's time. But for Wilson, I think Wilson. That's why he saw himself as this vanguard. He's like all the stupid rubes think this is working. I know it doesn't because I'm enlightened. And I'm beatified. I can see how a progressive would think that. I just don't see it in Wilson. I think Wilson thought of himself as being a classical liberal. No, he didn't. No, he wasn't. No, he didn't. Read Arthur Herman, who is like your, uh, he's not your rival at all. Your book was called How the Catholic Church Built Western Civilization. Built Western Civilization. His book was, was How the Scots. Yeah, I, I read his book on the Scots and I read his book on McCarthy. So I'm a, I'm a fan of no, him. You guys are, I, the bee's knees. I mean, you, he's wonderful. One of the most one of my top five books is by him, which is uh, The Idea of Decline in Western History. It's his first book. And how every generation, it's the end of the world. And it's, it's the environment, or it's oil, or it's uh, you, you know, race mixing, or it's this, or it's that. And he's like, none of these things ever panned out. So his book that just came out last year was called 1917. Yeah, I saw your interview. Yeah, and he, he compares Wilson to Lenin, not that they're at peas in a pod. But, and he talks about Wilson's psychology very heavily. I'll have he, to look at that. I mean, certainly the fact that he has mm-hmm. Colonel House as his close confidant, and House wrote that creepy book, Philip Drew Administrator, about what would happen if we could get one of our people in power and not really have to operate under constitutional right. restrictions. Here's what it would look like. So and, there is and that. And the other problem with Wilson and this it was, winds up looking like the U.S. today, which is not communist. No, no. I mean, I mean let's not, be precise. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying there's any part of Wilson that's a communist. I'm saying that that psychology is like, let's try it out over there, yeah. those people. If, if Herman can persuade me of this, maybe I can be brought on board. Um, and the other thing is there's no part of him that was a classical liberal. I mean, he was a virulent segregationist. I think he thought of himself as being in that tradition. I, I've seen... Well, yeah, all those leftists thought that we're the real liberals, right? And it's to this day, that's why the li- term liberal has become... But uh, yeah, I mean, to. you look at his actual record. I mean, what's progressive about... Or, or what's, you know, about... But on the other hand... The income tax he would view as progressive. Well, he, the other thing is he has that, um, which George W. Bush had. Uh, my editor uh, and I got into it because he was upset that I said that William F. Buckley's foreign policy was undiluted Wilsonism, 
which it was. Yeah. Um, and George W. Bush and Wilson had this in common. They really thought they were chosen by God. And frankly, if you're the president, I can see how you feel, see God's hands in it. Yeah, right. To basically save the world from itself. Wilson, George W. Bush, I don't know if you know this story, when he was advocating for France to let us into the war in Iraq, he, I think it was Mitterrand at the time, he said to the Frenchie, this is Gog and Magog. And the guy's like, uh, okay. And he gets off the phone. He's like, what the heck is this guy talking about? They had to find this as a reference to Revelation. Not very persuasive in France. Yeah. But Wilson also, you know, he, he comes from this very religious family, a southerner. He really thought he was, there was something very messianic about him. Yeah. Which FDR, I don't think, had. Yeah, that's definitely true. And that's then, very scary. And then there were plenty of progressives who didn't have the religious messianic uh, background. But these were still people who had been raised, a lot of them, in Presbyterian homes. Yes. They, they wanted the church picnic without the church. Yes. They, they wanted a lot of that cultural baggage, and I think they absorbed that way of looking at the world, oh, yes. a Manichaean way of looking at yes. the world. And then they also viewed the war, so I'm helping to make your case here, not that you need any help, but they, they looked at the war as an opportunity for the as an opportunity for the state to expand. Oh, yes. Because look at all the experimentation we'll be able to carry out under cover of war. The state will take over transportation, take over everything, and it will it will disabuse people of this terrible superstition about the, the, the um, sacrosanct nature of private property. Right, yeah. right. Uh, and that whole social gospel carries through to this day on yeah. uh, the left, and they don't even realize it. When you hear quotes that a society is judged by how you treat the weakest, this is the social gospel yeah. that they were talking about back then. Uh, that was from Howard. That's a great question. All right. Yeah, that was good. That was, um, maybe, I'm, maybe I would move toward... I mean, you know, this is a gentleman's disagreement. Which one of them... You never gave an answer. Oh, yeah, I never did actually give an answer. I mean, I, I tend toward Wilson, but I don't think it's as, as open and shut. Okay. Because I think FDR has left... When most people try to give examples or, or historical precedents for why we need more state involvement, they point to FDR, not Wilson. That's there's, my point. In terms of being a villain, there's a difference in my mind and in the law between a murderer and vehicular manslaughter. And I think FDR was bumbling about, didn't know what he was doing, was kind of this um, let's just see what works kind of mentality, yeah. was not a deep thinker, and Wilson had that vision. And that is always, to me, far yeah. more dangerous. Yeah, I guess, far more villainous. Yeah, I would, I would rather have an amiable dolt yeah. than a committed ideologue. Yeah. yeah. Um, would your opinion of Trump improve if he renamed the dollar to the smacker? <laughs> Get out of here. By the way, can I say something about that? Of course. I use the word smackers when I, when I mean dollars on my show and in my emails. And I do that just because I like the word smackers, but also... The main reason, actually, I'll tell you this. This is uh, I shouldn't tell this story, but when I was working as a doorman at, a, at an apartment building when I was in college, there was this much older woman who obviously had an interest in me, but she was way, way, way older. How is like sixties? Uh, approaching it. Okay, it was not reasonable. Okay, the graduate. And, and I recall she came down, and she used to come down to deliver, a, and she'd want me to put something in the mail for her. It would be a Saturday night. They're not getting it till Monday morning. So she came, she came in one day to announce to me that she had just gotten the flu shot, and it was well worth the 10 smackers. And I always thought, okay, that was kind of funny. That I like funny. the way, yeah. so I used that word. But it turns out the reason I, I use it is that in some of my emails when I'm talking about money, if you say dollars and you have dollar amounts, the spam filters target that email and they don't want to deliver it or they put it in the spam folders. So I use the word smackers to evade the spam filter. Okay, okay, that's very smart. Garrett, put up the phone number in case people want to call in, although I don't know. I thought you were doxing me. Put up my phone number. No, no, no. Yeah. Uh, here's a good one from Lambo Wolf. Who is smarter, Kevin Goodsman or Jordan Peterson? Oh, I, I think it's apples and oranges because they have smarts in different areas, but my... I actually think Kevin is smarter. Oh. Yeah, and I say that not because he's more likely to listen to this than Jordan Peterson. Okay. But, I mean, Jordan Peterson is really great. I mean, he has obviously has a vast knowledge of a lot of things, and he's great at giving advice, and he's encouraged a lot of people. But in terms of just sheer knowledge, like dumps of knowledge, well, that's kind of an unfortunate turn of Jordan phrase. Jordan Peterson knows what the Gulag Archipelago is, and Kevin did not. Oh, you stopped that. <laughs> um... This is a great question. Does take you last last week or the week before took was it Amy to Santa Monica? 
Oh, Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Yeah. Does taking one daughter to Santa Monica and another to New York illustrate revealed preference? Oh, that's funny. Yeah, we went to Santa Barbara, actually. Oh, okay. Santa Monica is where well, you're, companies you, Now are. you're blocked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. No, I mean, honestly, it was just that I, I was going to be gone for only a couple of days. I had never been on a separate trip with little Elizabeth, who's only eight. And I thought, what the heck? It's so absurd for us to fly completely the other end of the country just for a couple of days and come all the way back. She'd be the one at her age who would complain the least about the absurdity of the situation and just have fun. Whereas with Veronica, we're in New York City because it was part of her birthday present. Have you ever read Camus? I read The Stranger a long time ago. You've never read his nonfiction? No. I would be so interested in hearing what you have to say about it. Because his whole, he's incorrectly, and finally they've come around on this, um, described as an existentialist. But his whole philosophy is the philosophy of absurdism. And the idea is once you accept the absurdity that is life, it's very liberating. And, in, like, and I, like, here's a good example in a very small venue, and I'm sure he wouldn't use this example. If I'm at a restaurant and the service is terrible and the food is terrible, I'd rather it be as terrible as possible. Because it's like, let me at least get an experience out of it <laughs> exactly. and enjoy it. Like, yeah. rather than, eh, it was a crappy meal, I'm like, okay, they're giving me boiling water and the guy doesn't speak English. And there's, why is there a dog here? Like, I would rather have that. And when you look at life like that and take bad things in that vein, his famous example is the myth of Sisyphus. And Sisyphus is this um, a mythological figure from Greek mythology who is punished by the gods. He has to roll a rock up a hill for eternity. And right when he gets the rock at the very top, it falls out of his hands and falls to the bottom. The rock has to do this over and over. And Camus says Sisyphus is happy because once he's accepted the ridiculousness of his situation and he knows the reality that is his reality, that he can accept it and be liberated from it. Yeah, I think that's a stretch too far. But I, I, get, I get the point. And I think it's easy to be liberated these days because I, I think it's not – I don't have to look particularly far for absurd situations. They seem to find me wherever I go these days. No, but I think it's also in a very it's, – it's like the idea of don't sweat the small stuff. But it's also don't sweat the big stuff. Like my friend, I was talking to her. She was talking to all these elderly people. And the one thing they all said is I wouldn't have worried so much. You know, like you, and you remember when you're 20, what you were worried about when you were 25. Well, you know, you know, I think even as I am in, you know, I'm in middle age now, 45, I, you know, I still fight for the same things I used to fight for, but I'm much more concerned about my immediate surroundings yeah. and my immediate family and, and not so much about saving the world, which I can't do. I do my best with the resources I have, but I now think about, well, these people now are going to be taking over from me and I have to right. provide for them. So let's talk a little bit about your, your social conservatism, because I'm very, very culturally left, right? So I don't understand how when you were in New York at Columbia, uh, you never like, went sat downtown. Like, I don't understand. Can you explain that to me? Well, <laughs> there's a part of it that's just simply a matter of once the streets stop being numbered, I don't know my way around. I can't... I don't know where anything is. I can't figure anything out. Okay. I like the grid system. But the Columbia is at what, 119th? Uh, yeah, 116th is so the you station. So you have 100 stuff. blocks, literally, where the, the, it's the grid. Yeah, but I mean, I used to, I had friends in different parts of the city, but, okay. and I would do different things, but um, it's one of these, it's like I never went to see a lot of the, um, the well-known landmarks of New York City, because I thought, yeah, I, I, you know, I'm with that. Yeah. But it, there's still so much more to explore than the landmarks. That's true, but I, I mean, I had friends associated with, I went to a really neat, sounds, I sound like I'm 12 years old, but I went to a really neat church at okay. 43rd Street in Lexington, St. Agnes, and I met really tremendous, super smart, great, wonderful people. And we used to do all kinds of fun things together on weekends and, and whatever, but it, I didn't know that much about what went on around the city because I was focused on my studies most of the time. And on the weekends, well, I would want to be with my regular friends and we'd go out drinking right near where we lived, so in case I drank too much, it was easy to get back. So, here, here's the example. When I was in Orlando... I'm sorry, my answers are so mundane to this. <laughs> no, but it's, um, I, I think your fans like trying to understand how you think, and this is something that I can't wrap my head around, so I'm trying to break it yeah, down okay. also. When I was in Orlando, I was speaking at the Orlando branch of the Council on Foreign Relations, and actually, they were awesome. And what was really funny is that when I landed, uh, the woman there said to me, Michael, I just, I read your Twitter. Are you well? 
I loved that. It was great. And she meant because I tweeted out that airplanes and sinuses are arch enemies, but it sounded like, what is what the F is wrong? I, I so wanted it to be that know, other I meaning. <laughs> um, but one of the things they talked about, like everyone there was very well traveled, you know, they're good globalists. And there's a lyric from this band called Saint Etienne, who I love. And the lyric is, I like the feeling of being slightly lost. And to me, to be in a city where, as long as you're in a safe neighborhood, and to just be wandering around is like the height of fun and adventure. And you don't have that. I don't know. I mean, I used to go on long walks and explore. But okay, I that's what I'm where, talking about. I, but I didn't really know where I was going. But that's, I that's, to, that's what I mean. I'd be said, frustrated and I would walk down, I'd walk from 116th down to 34th Street. Okay. And then I would walk all the way back. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, so you did it to exploring. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I thought you meant like the nightlife. Of no, the no, 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 no. That's, that's not what I meant at all. I, I meant quite the opposite, like just wandering around during the day and seeing where this road takes you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I definitely did that. I, I, I always wished at that time that I had more money because I would go buy all these places that I wanted to visit or places I wanted to eat at. And, I, and so now that I have more money, now that we're here, we're doing all those things from however many years ago that was. We're, we're going to have a fun little adventure after this show, and Veronica doesn't know what it is, but it's going to be a hoot and a half. <laughs> cool. um, here's something else that was just fascinating, because I think, I don't like the term uh, cultural conservative, because everyone has a boundary beyond which they're not comfortable. Some boundaries are just closer to the individual than others. Right. But at a certain point, when you're looking at things you're not familiar with, you can't tell, anyone can't tell, it's at a distance, if it's original interesting, unique, or deranged and debauchery. It all, it's just like, I, I don't like this. And it was fascinating with you because we were in Florida and you never had sushi. And I'm like, okay, let's make you have try sushi. Right. And just watching you argue with yourself, you, you said out loud, you go, why am I having this? Why can't I have something just, you know, really American? You go, well, that's dumb. <laughs> You're like, that's, what kind of argument is that? I, there's lots of things I like that aren't American. Let me try this. You're like, eh, I don't really like it one way or another. But I think the thing is, it's important for all of us uh, and I know I'm this way for you, and I have people who are this way for me, to have that person who is more on the edge to be like, no, no, just, this is safe. This yeah. is not debauchery. It's yeah. just Japanese. Yeah, that's right. And that's why I, I have so much fun with you, because I feel like even though we're, we're not in agreement on some things, you're not going to take me to a place where you don't think I'd be comfortable going. That's exactly right. And it's the same way with Matt Hughes. You know, when I hang out with him, like, like I, I brought him over to my grandparents' house, and he was trying Russian. Do you know what kvass is? No. Kvass, it's bread soda. Russians drink it. <laughs> and it's, it's fine. It's like, right. it's like ginger ale, like in terms of like how weird it is. But he was just like, eh. But it's just like, you need that Russian to tell you, you're not going to like it. You're not going to hate it. You're going to be like, okay, I've had bread soda. What I love about how different all your kids wind up being is that my Regina, who's 14 years old, has qualities I just don't have. And I don't know where she got them, but I don't even care because it's just fascinating. So she's, of course, had been eating sushi for years, not at my urging because right, right. her parents don't eat, don't eat it. But she's dying to go to Japan and visit oh, wow. there. And, and I mean, I'd be glad That's to amazing. take her, but it just never would have occurred to me to go. But now that she told me about it, I thought, yeah, why would I not want to go to Japan? Right, yeah. right. but that's, I think that's how the conservative mind works. You, and I don't mean you specifically. You don't think of doing these things. But when someone suggests that there's a visceral no, then you're like, wait, why not? Yeah. <laughs> like, well, why not other than I haven't done it? <laughs> right, right, yeah. So we're, I'm starting to branch out. Into, yeah. yeah. Um, what else do we have here? We have a question from, ooh, did you watch the Gore Vidal-William de Buckley debate? I should. It's the one where Buckley just just loses it. There's that documentary. No, they did a series of them. There was so basically at the Republican convention or the Democrat or both in '64, um, both Buckley and Gore Vidal, who are two of the vilest human beings to ever walk the face of the earth, to ever crawl the face of the earth, uh, they were there commenting, and they were all so both so smug and taken with their brilliance. And at one point, Buckley just completely loses it well, because Vidal, I think, called him a crypto fascist. Correct. And Buckley had served in the military, did Buckley's defense. But if you watch it, it's just, oh, I mean, I don't know who the big, the bigger villain there is Buckley, but it's still so repellent to watch. I still have not made time, though, to, if you can believe it, to, I'm ashamed to say this in your presence. Do you know what I'm going to say? Two peaks? No, uh, no, I, that I do, I, I am going to get to. I'm okay. just finishing some stuff, because I'm, I'm basically out of town for two weeks, including right. this week, so I couldn't, but yeah, I am going to do that. I started watching the first episode. No, no, it's, I haven't watched that whole Ayn Rand Donahue. There's two uh, of them. Appearance. Yeah, see? I haven't, I haven't done it. 
I know, I know. I'll get to it. I'll get to it. For what, I did start to watch her appearance on The Tonight Show with Carson. Yeah, that's not as good. Okay. Ayn Rand on Donahue has what I would consider the greatest moment in libertarian history where I'm not even, there's two things. One of which she yells at the audience that she's not the victim of hippies in those words. I am not the victim of hippies. And at one point during this episode, a woman, housewifey looking woman, glasses, whatever, gets up and says to Rand, isn't it true that your book, Atlas Shrugged, was written by the Illuminati? In, this is Madison Square Garden. Can we, I, I, it's, it's, I, I don't know how to fast forward to it. Um, it's, it's the woman has glasses on and uh, black hair. Uh, there's actually two women with glasses. And Rand goes, the who? The Illuminati, the Trilateral Commission, the Rothschilds, and all the Rockefellers and all the Bilderbergers. And Donahue's like, w it's amazing. This actually happened in real life. And the next year, when Donahue's like, oh, I read an interview of yours, and you were all over the map. You said you like Charlie's Angels? She's like, yes, I like it because it's not like all the other shows today, which are about the half-wit retard children. <laughs> Oh yeah, I don't know what show she's watching. I've never seen a show uh, living in the gutter. I don't know what halfway. Maybe she meant the the Waltons. I don't know what she meant. That's crazy. So you have to watch this okay. because she's goes from brilliant to bonkers in the space of a second. That's great. There's so and the worst interview with her is Tom Snyder, who can't get his head around the fact that she's an atheist, and he says. God bless you, Ayn Rand, thinking she's going to burst into fire and like, oh no, and she goes, thank you. That means the highest possible. Yeah, right. She's like, I'm, I don't mean it literally, but okay. Yeah, <laughs> like, right. what did you think was going to happen? Exactly. I know that you mean something good to me when you say that, yeah. so, so I accept it. Like, I mean, there, does this bother you as a Catholic person, these like atheist libertarians who were like, for example, uh, it was, who was that, Sam Harris? There was some situation, there was someone like uh, in the hospital and someone tweeted, like, you be in your prayers. You go, if you're praying, you're not giving credit to those doctors and nurses who actually <laughs> saved this person. I go, fine. Think of it as meditation to calm your anxiety. Yeah. Like, it, does that not bother you? It yeah. bothers me. Yeah. And then these days now with the gun thing, now the fashionable thing is, I don't care about your thoughts and prayers. What they, and, of course, by that, that's supposed to show how sophisticated they are. Right. But here's how sophisticated they are. Their next thought is, I care about legislation. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I don't care if you're an atheist. If, especially if you're an intelligent atheist, thoughts and prayers mean a heck of a lot more than legislation. Yeah, amen. <laughs> amen, brother. Um, we're not going to ask this question. Um, <laughs> do you... Um, what are your... Th well, this is a stupid one. A lot of, a lot of uh, anything but Hamilton. He wants to know, if you could bathe in any liquid, what would it be? <laughs> <laughs> See, can I, actually, wait a minute. I'll get to that. But I Why watched are you pointing? that. Jesus, because you did, that, you did that. <laughs> you, did that matters, you did that great um, uh, YouTube live thing. Um, yeah, not too long ago. live streaming. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I just happened to see that you were doing it, and so I clicked on and started watching. And you're going through about 587 questions. It's a cash cab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. In in about 28 minutes, you had already done 587 questions. And I thought to myself, see, that's why I can't do that. Because I would take each one, and I would, I'd have 12 caveats, and I'd be thinking about it for 40 minutes. So with this one, I have absolutely no idea what the answer to that is. <laughs> let's, let's talk this through. All right, let's do it. The easy answer is water. Right. Uh, something that's like a toothpaste consistency would not be fun. No. Foam would be fun. Maybe. Yeah, yeah but you could have bubble baths. You'd have foam yeah. and water. Um, soda would not be good. It'd be sticky. Yeah. The problem with any liquid is it's going to leave a residue. Yeah. So I think we're just going to have to stick with the old... See, there's my social conservatism again. I'm going to go with water. Yeah, well, is, there what, something, wait, is there something that's like a little bit astringent-y, which would kind of leave... You know, like when you wipe your face with astringent, it feels nice? Yeah. It might be something like that, but a whole tub of it wouldn't be good. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure... Yeah, I'm yeah, that, sure there yeah, is an that's, that's one of those questions that sounds better than it is. Yeah. I am so nearsighted, I can't read any of these calls. Um, let's take the call from Jeff from Houston. Hi, Michael. Uh, I wanted to, I'm listening in right now. I missed whatever question it was that you're discussing with Tom. 
something about water and you didn't miss anything. I promise. <laughs> okay, uh, and I also heard you talking about this this live stream you did. I was I asked the question about whether you'd rather be sticky forever or itchy forever. Oh, uh, that was a tough one. I don't have an answer, which is a cop out. I hate it when people don't answer those questions, and I'm being a hypocrite. I chose itchy, by the way. Uh, so I wanted to ask Tom, uh, who. I enjoy every video I've watched and then, Wait, wait, wait. Hold uh, on. Up, 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 up. You're from Houston, sure. huh? Yes. You guys must be real proud of your barbecue, huh? Uh, I'm quite proud of my barbecue, yes. But I went to school in Austin, and they're even more proud of their barbecue. That's true. Ever had Brooklyn barbecue? It's taken over the world. Uh, Brooklyn as in barbecue from the area of Brooklyn, or is that the name of a place? No, it's the, it, so there was, I don't know if you saw this, some art, there's an article, apparently it's four years old. Someone resurrected it, and it said, why is Brooklyn barbecue taking over the world? And the photo they used was terrible. It was like a giant plate with like a little piece, there it is, that photo. It looks like prison food. <laughs> and then everyone from Brooklyn was like, yeah, we're the best. <laughs> and I've been, Ted Cruz just wrote like, oh gosh, and I wrote, Shut up, mf -er. You're from Canada. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, Houston people, the Houston Chronicle, recently retweeted that picture, and they said something about attacking Brooklyn barbecue, blah, 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 Houston's so great. And I retweeted them. I go, what, be besides barbecue, which is not original to your crappy little village, what cultural contributions have you, have you brought to America? And they brought a lot, it turns out. Uh, Beyonce? Breast implants, yes. excuse me, AstroTurf, domed stadiums, and NASA. So those are good answers. Yes, uh, and the rapper Zero. Yeah. Um, Paul Wallace, a millionaire. Yeah. So uh, I could I could go on and on about Houston. You really can't. Uh, you That's the list. I couldn't. No. <laughs> That's the list. The, there's a worse video of uh, barbecue, which is this vegan, disgusting looking vegan ribs that someone made out of tofu. It was the grossest looking thing I've ever seen. Uh, that's probably grosser than the Brooklyn barbecue picture you're talking about. Brooklyn barbecue is not gross. It's the, what's great about Brooklyn barbecue, which no one could really argue about if they were being serious, is the innovation. So the thing about New York is you take things from other cultures and you put your unique spin on it. So saying Brooklyn barbecue, because they said saying Brooklyn has great barbecue is like saying Wichita has great sushi. It's like, no, it's like saying New York has great sushi. Sushi is not original to New York. No one's going to argue that New York doesn't have great sushi. But please go ahead with your question. All right. Um, I, I'm trying to remember what it was. Okay. So I, uh, one, this may be something I could easily Google uh, for your thoughts on, Tom. I wanted to know what you think about the free market, anarcho-capitalist version of a legal system, uh, and specifically, what do you do for lawsuits involving negligence, tortious, uh, non-intentional uh, acts that cause someone else harm? How do you resolve those disputes? All right, well, I mean... Amicably, right. peacefully. Yeah, I mean, I think this is one of these things where there's a. Wait, let me answer your question. And, and, and Ed Stringham's a, book, Ed Stringham's book, Anarchy and the Law, is like 600 pages and has essays about all this stuff. This is a very technical question, but it's not yeah. that hard because what I'll, I'm sorry to answering for you, but like the point is, you're you're sometimes you just have to cuddle, tuck, uh, take your losses. You like you split the difference. If me and Tom have a disagreement, he mailed me something. It's the wrong size, but I wrote I had a typo. Fine, you pay shipping, I get the refund. You know what I mean? Right. You work it out. Yeah, but but, that, but that's the way an arbitrator would also want to yeah. work it out. Is a way that both sides feel like okay, it's a fair result, which is right. not typically what you get with politically appointed judges right. in the current system. But the other thing, I mean, there could be two ways of interpreting the question. One could be how do you do it uh, in in terms of. You know, who, do you have legal, le competing legal system? That sort of question, or it could simply be who's in the who who wins if it's a case of I didn't mean to right. run over your dog, or I didn't mean I was just shooting my BB gun around and I happened to shoot him in the face right. and that sort of thing, as opposed to I intended to do it. But I think I think uh, the, the point is if you did the damage. I mean, yeah, you're, if, if you had an intent to do the damage, that intensifies the guilt. Yes. You're still guilty. You still did the damage. You still have to make restitution. And this is where insurance would regulate behavior. Exactly. Well, yeah. I, I really like the insurance idea. I think that kind of solves a lot of it. But uh, more from like a moral perspective, if you're someone who, uh, who who's 
principle of libertarianism is based upon non-aggression, what's the level of intent required before something is an actual act of aggression? If I leave a banana peel on the floor and you trip on it, have I aggressed against you? The, you like, know, can I, Jeff, I, wait, hold on, hold on. I'm going to cut this. This is literally what the Talmud is. So the Talmud, which I had to study, is like this. So the Bible, the Torah, the Old Testament, has like a few hundred laws that Jews have to follow. And the Talmud is this series of like dozens of books. And they, they, the hairs they split for, here's the example I had to learn. What, stealing. What if you find something on the floor that is large but cheap, like pomegranates, and there's no one around? If you take them in your pocket, is that stealing? Or... What if it's small but expensive, like sesame seeds? Is that stealing? You, you know what I mean? Then they go into, your house has to have no bread during Passover. What if you see a mouse grab a crust of bread and go into the wall? Is it still bread free? What if you see a white mouse have a crust of bread into the wall and you see a black mouse run out of your house with a crust? So questions like this are so technical and precise, there's not going to be an easy answer. Right. So, so the way you handle things like this is not by trying to anticipate all the cases in advance right. or trying to establish this would be the precise level of intent right. that you'd have to cross because each case is different. It really is a case where this really is a case where law is a discovery process yeah. where you get an accumulated series of cases from competent people and they form the backdrop for future decisions. There really isn't any way to, to do this from scratch from the beginning. Jeff, what you're basically asking is what would be the price in a free society for this act because this is a cost. And it's like, it would absolutely depend on the circumstances. Yeah, and it depend on two person, people. Yeah. Like if I tripped and, and hit Veronica by accident, it, in one situation, it could be like, okay. Another one, it's like, no, you know what? I don't believe you. And I think that's really bad. And you, you're, you're sloppy around kids too much. I want some, a pound of flesh. And both of those are very valid approaches. And, and also there could be a case where I did a little bit of damage to your property. And most people would just resolve that easily. But it could be that this particular property has such incalculable sentimental value for you that you are going to be a real stickler about how you handle and so or you, you did it or i did it to spite you just to, like i'm not touching yeah. you it's right. like no 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 even though you didn't do the damage you need to learn a lesson so these are all possible um scenarios let's take this call from cameron from michigan hey michael hey cameron hey uh i wanted to ask if either of you think that a society can ever slowly move to being more free or does it always move to being more tyrannical I think we are moving toward more freedom. And what about the Soviet Union? Well, no, so, I, mean, I mean, without like a sharp, short revolution. Yeah, yeah he means just can, can freedom, can it be like Fabian socialism in reverse? I, I think, go, yeah. I, I, go ahead, Tom. Can freedom just advance ever yeah. so slightly? Or does it have to be like the Berlin Wall right. coming down and it's a dramatic, dramatic movement? Um, it's, I, I think it's, um, I think it's more, I think there, well, it's hard to answer because I can imagine both scenarios. I can conceive of there's a massive ideological shift in the population, as I think has happened at various times in history. Um, but what tends to happen with the slow thing, I mean, I know that your view is that things are getting better for, you know, for the fact that anybody in the world basically can read or listen to anything I produce. Well, not only, well, here's how this. Harry, this is my argument with the alt-right, and I talk about this in my forthcoming book. I handed in the draft on Monday. Harry Truman, right, the steel workers were going to go on strike. Before they even went on strike, he tried to seize the steel industry. Can you even imagine Bernie Sanders advocating for this? Yeah, that's true. There are a lot, yeah, and, and there's no way that the, the, the internment of the Japanese could, it could be conceivable today. Right. I, don't, I, th I just think that's inconceivable. So th that's true, that a lot of the great enormities of the past seem hard for us to imagine now. And that does constitute some kind of improvement. But if we're looking at, let's say, uh, whether it's, uh, it could be some regulation on something. Sure. Regulations tend to, I mean, Trump is showing that you can slow it down or reverse it marginally Regu regulations tend to increase oh, because yes. there are who knows all the le all the ins and outs of why one part of one industry wants a regulation and the other doesn't and which interest group wins out over the other one but the average person has no dog in that fight and so it just g grows and grows and grows and it's it's the whole public choice point that if your interest if, if you earn six figures a year because we have um, sugar quotas 
then you're going to lobby 24 hours a day to keep the sugar quotas, whereas the average person loses so little from the sugar quotas that he doesn't bother organizing against it. And so that's why you get more and more groups over time realizing, well, wait a minute, then the way to wealth is to organize politically and get quotas for my product. Doesn't it drive you crazy that the term for that is rent-seeking? Yeah, that yeah. Term being, that's, where does that word come from? Yeah, it's, it's so it's stupid. It's very annoying. But... So that's how I can understand why you would think it's just going to get worse and worse and worse because the interest in perpetuating this system is concentrated in people whose livelihoods depend on it and the, 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 the people who suffer are so dispersed and disorganized. But the people who talked about that all the time, the public choice folks whom I have great respect for, I think these were people who were completely – well, I guess everybody was blindsided by the fall of the Soviet Union, but they especially because – well, shouldn't the rent-seeking process just continue and yeah. continue and continue? They couldn't anticipate there could be a point where the whole system that does in some way rest on popular consent can't go on anymore. Um, so that's why, to me, I feel like in the short run, these small – I think the small movements tend to be in favor of statism, and then there's some crisis, and then the question is what happens in the crisis. Thanks, Cameron. Um, here's a question I want to know. Would you be as – I don't know if protective is the word, but I'll throw it out there, of Murray Rothbard if you hadn't actually met him. Yeah, I would. Because, I mean, it's... No, but it's, it would be different. I mean, can you reason that out? How, how yeah, let me different? reason that out. I mean, first of all, let's just talk about, I probably met him a handful of times. It's still a big deal. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, believe me, I cherish yeah. those memories very much. But it, How tall was he? Was he tiny? He was, he was short. I mean, I, was I taller than he was? Yeah, because there's a picture of the two of us. Um, that I have on my Facebook account. Yeah, that's right. And man, do I look like an idiot in that picture, but I didn't even care. Yeah. <laughs> but those parts of my life are not... I mean, I was convinced by him before I met him. And then when I found out years and years later that he had enemies within the libertarian movement, I just found this inconceivable. And I always based it on, look, if you've re have you read these books? Have you read what I've read? Like, if you read his book on the Great Depression, that's an amazing work. What an incredible accomplishment. Or, or, or even just his popular writings, his columns, and the vastness of his knowledge. Or you could ask him, you could ask him, what are some bibliographical references for such and such thing? And he just knew. He just knew this stuff. He, he read so voraciously. And the fact that he would read people he knew he disagreed with, but he, would, he just knew some people are just so good. There are going to be some gems in what I read here. And I just felt – I've always felt like there's so much for me to learn from him, not just academically, but the way he conducted himself that, that when he gets attacked, it's always for – three quotations he said 50 years ago. And I mean, I've been the victim of that too. And I'm so sick of that. I'm so sick of the, you said a forbidden thing 50 years ago, therefore you're not worth anything. Or I think the Southern Poverty Law Center, their whole summary of Rothbard is to say that he was critical of lesbians during the progressive era. I don't even know what he had to say about that, but somehow they found that. that was, they have nothing to say about his contributions to economics or whatever, economic calculation, I, none of that. I've been advocating that the S should be changed to Soviet. Yeah, and the L, according to Tom DiLorenzo, should be changed to lie. So Soviet oh, yeah. Poverty Lie Center. So, Soviet Party Lie Center. Yeah, so, so, so no, no, no. I, I, it's, it's purely on a scholarly level that I'm, I'm as – because I just feel like – if you produce that much and you are that indispensable and you can still be kind of ignored or laughed at or wink, wink, we all. Oh, there's the picture. Him. Oh, jeez. <laughs> How did they dig that one out? I think I'm slightly taller, right? Am I slightly taller? Oh, stop that. We all have embarrassing photos, Michael Malice. Yeah, but there's – and the shirt and the shorts. Yeah, it was a sweatshirt because I just bought it. And I didn't want to have to carry it around, so I put it on. That makes perfect sense. <laughs> <laughs> See, now people who are listening to so the he, audience, I always thought of him being a lot fatter than this. Oh, yeah, he's looking pretty good, isn't he's he? He's looking pretty lean, yeah. yeah I actually, so, I never knew him any other time, so I don't know. Huh, maybe he was in poor health. Because this was, what year was this? Ballpark? This was 1993, and, and he, he died in, in January of 95. Okay, so maybe his health was starting yeah, so to So, I don't know, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, what? I mean, are there any questions that you regret not having asked him? There must be a ton. Jeez, boy, that's a good one. And here's another good question. People ask me, how do you know what Kim Jong-il thought about X, Y, and Z? I'm like, do you think there's any doubt what Kim Jong-il thought about anything in North Korea? Yeah. Everything's a function of him. Yeah. Rothbard wrote so voluminously. Is there anything where you are like, I wonder what he would think about X, Y, and Z? Because it seems like he really covered it all. 
Yeah, he really. I mean, even things like popular culture. Uh, he wrote about. I mean, he wrote about movie. He wrote movies, movie reviews, probably hundreds of them. Yeah, movie reviews. Um, and and I also love this. This will turn some people off to him, but he was not a Star Wars fan he, at all. He hated the sci-fi nerds. <laughs> he railed against them. And he's a, you know he's the leader of the libertarians. I mean, right? look at that dork, and he's like, why do they all like sci-fi? <laughs> It's like you're like a Jawa. Yeah, I mean, it's more a question of I, I, I more wish I had him around now to ask him about current events. Like, okay. What would be his assessment of Trump, for example? You would know what his assessment would be. Yeah, but it would be like 50 times more detailed than okay. I can see. That's him. fair. You know? That's fair. Um, God, that, that must have been, I mean, were you nervous about meeting him? Yeah, of course. I, I was, but then it was it's one of these things where he really wants to talk to you. He really okay. wants to see what you're doing and how you came to all this because at that time there still weren't that many of us. And so he's as excited as, as you are, is an odd thing. So Lou Rockwell always tells the story of us being at the Mises University summer program and Rothbard and I were just chit-chatting and Lou said he walked away and did something else. He came back a really long time later and we're still talking and oh, talking, yeah. talking, 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 talking. And you know, that that was because that's who he was. I mean, he didn't say to himself, well, look, I'm Murray Roth, but I don't have time to talk to this, you know, idiot kid uh, all night. But he did, he made that. Or I wrote him a letter, and I thought, well, you know, obviously he's not going to write back to me. He typed, he, he used his typewriter to type out a reply to I me. I hope you still have it. Yeah, I still got okay, it. Okay, good. Because I was saying, you know, you keep mentioning this leaflet from the 60s, and of course now it's impossible to find it. Uh, any chance you happen to know where I could find one? He mailed me two copies of that leaflet. It was Robert Lefebvre's thing on um, the Cold War. And it was – and so in my book, We Who Dared to Say No to War, that I co-edited with a, with a left-wing guy, I took that pamphlet, which is in the public domain – and we published it. it. Would have been gone forever. It's just in, no one has it other than Rothbard. But he mailed it to me, and then I was able to get it published. Robert Lefebvre. How do you pronounce it? I think it's Lefebvre. Robert Lefebvre um, is a pacifist. Yeah, it was yeah. Right. And one or two times, I know at least once, someone broke into his house, and rather than defend himself, he acted crazy to scare the guy off. That's clever. Is it? I'd rather have the gun. Yeah, I would too. But if it worked, did it work? Yes. <laughs> those are big dice to roll. Yeah, no, those are no. You I'm not why? suggesting because if them. someone's coming at me crazy, I'm more likely to pull the yeah, trigger. Oh yeah, sure. And if someone's like, "Hey, take what you want." Yeah. Oh, that's funny. I didn't know that. Him and Galambos is the other one. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's a book by uh, um, T J, uh, J D Tichili. Yeah. It usually starts that's with right, Ayn Rand. Right, yeah. And he goes through all the kooks. Who are around at you know to be a libertarian back then something really had to be wrong with you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean no, I, I mean unambiguously because yeah. you're paying a huge social cost. Yeah. To be this freak show. Yeah. Uh, someone who Rand also did what Rothbard did. She loved talking to young people until all hours of the night uh, and just holding court and so on and so forth. She was really into it. One of the uh, um, let's see, is it Veronica? No, it's uh, her name's Veronica. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out which of my kids have Roger McCaffrey as their godfather. Oh, okay. It's two of the other ones. But Roger McCaffrey's father was Neil McCaffrey, who was one of Rothbard's closest friends. Okay. And Neil McCaffrey was the most traditionalist Latin mass Catholic around. And he founded the conservative book club, and he was in the National Review orbit. Not entirely comfortably, but that was the only game in town, so he was part of that. But he also created Arlington House Publishers. Oh, which, which was, was amazing. Only, the only publisher yes. published libertarian books at that time. And Rothbard and he did not see eye to eye on the Cold War and, you know, on religious questions, but they loved jazz and they had a lot of the same people they couldn't stand, whatever. And they became extremely close and, and they That's both amazing. really valued each other. Yeah, there you go. How, how great, how wonderful that is. Um, but, but, is that but, the Fee Mansion? That must be the Fee Mansion. Oh, it could well be. But Which, you see what I mean? I mean, th that's that's the kind of guy I think we should all try to be. That's the guy Rothbard. The, the, the image of him as if you deviate from me 0.01%, I will denounce you and you'll never be heard from again. Well, you know, McCaffrey deviated from him quite oh, a bit. Oh, you're, you're, you're singing my close. song. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, that, that's really funny. Um, what do you – <laughs> I had a great question and I completely lost it. Well, that's Alzheimer's for you. Um what do you think Rothbard would be most upset about in contemporary America? Uh, well, I think... What, am I, what are you most upset about in contemporary America? 
Well, what I was going to say is I think for sure he'd be cheering on Jordan Peterson. So anything oh, yes. bothering Jordan Peterson, I think, would bother him, yes. too. Oh, no, this is what I want to ask you. Yeah, go ahead. Let yeah. Me yeah, ask yeah, go ahead and ask it, yeah. What do you think, and I have my answer, of Whitaker Chambers? Uh, okay, well... Tell people who he is. Well, I never read Witness. Okay. But he's the guy who... Put up a picture of him because he's disgusting beyond belief. Uh, what, the, the, his image is disgusting? Yes. All right, so... Yeah, that's the picture I was thinking of, because look, his, she's so fat, he's stretching the buttons on his gut. All right, so... Buttons, what, oh, you, you dis, oh, disgusting. All right, so he's involved creature. in the Alger Hiss case. Yes. And he, he uh, contends that Hiss is a Soviet agent. Because he, he, he was a communist. Right. Trotsky, and then he became he a converted. hardcore Catholic. Right. And then he became a conservative part of the conservative movement. And made it a point to throw every libertarian under the bus as frequently as possible. Well, he was the one who wrote the obituary for Ayn Rand. In oh, the, the review. Oh, did he write the review? Oh, it wasn't the obituary. You're right. Rothbard, it was the review. Buckley wrote the obituary. I was getting obituary. confused with the Rothbard obitu obituary. What did you think of Buckley's obituary of Rothbard? Do you remember that? Yeah, that, I thought that was pretty nasty. I yes, mean, I, mean, I he, cite that in my book. He couldn't at least say, look, I never really agreed with this guy, but he was a brilliant economist. I mean, if Ludwig von Mises thinks he's a brilliant economist, then... Oh, you know what Whitaker Chambers said about uh, Ludwig von Mises? No. He's the know-nothingness of the know-nothing branch of conservatism. Yeah. That but was his review of human action. Yeah, because I'm pretty and sure... He also, he, said was, Mi he also said Mises doesn't know what he's talking about because Mises equates anti-capitalism with envy, and he said, when I was a communist, I never envied capitalism. <laughs> That's not what he means at all, but, but uh, yeah, I think Chambers' view, or no, also Russell Kirk's view, is that what civilization needs now is not another dose of reason in the form of a 900-page book. That's just not going to penetrate their thick skulls. But on the other hand, what are we supposed to do? Read Edmund Burke? I mean, right. you know, got to write something. But yeah, Chambers' view, Chambers became one of these conservatives who I, th there's a lot of them who, who think that libertarians who are worried about, who have some concern about economics, they put everything in terms of dollars and cents and they're materialistic. I have not really known very many libertarians who meet that match that description. Right. Most of the libertarians I know are broke. I always say that. That's this annoys you know, me. Kinsella also talks about that very frequently. Yeah, yeah. That's not that's not a good quality. But obviously, it's not what's driving them to libertarianism. And like the, all the, the rich people tend to be either socialist or middle of the road Republican or whatever. When Buckley wrote his obituary of Rothbard, yeah, he said Rothbard loved liberty. David Koresh loved religion. Yeah. Rothbard had his followers, and David Koresh had his. Yeah. Who David Koresh was, for people to remember, the was, Waco guy. was a guy at Waco who was accused of abusing all these children in the most horrific ways, who, who said he was the Messiah. Right. I went and did the research for my book. Rothbard on Facebook has 22,000 likes. Buckley has three. So it's very clear who is the one who's leading a impotent, pathetic movement and who's actually resonating with the population. Well, and also, even though people uh, criticize and insult Rothbard, he's a, he's a living figure worth talking about right. in the first place. You know, there are plenty of people who did nothing we don't talk about at all. But I don't know anybody who's reading Bill Buckley anymore. Right. Who's reading God and Man at Yale today? Right. Nobody. Right. So, and, and so my editor's a Buckley guy. Um. So I, we've been going uh, hammer and tongs about this. I have a quote. He's like, I don't want your views on Buckley. I'm like, fine, I'll quote people. Yeah. And I have Vox Day who says, when the alt-right takes over, the first thing, one of the first things we're going to do is dig up Bill Buckley's corpse and set it on fire. <laughs> I go, not coming from me. Here's your quote. <laughs> yeah, there you, go. you want a quote. Enjoy. Mine was actually going to be slightly nicer than that. No, actually, I said he had the wit and charisma of Stalin. Oh, <laughs> that's funny. Because for him to be, to me, being a Catholic is having a sense of magnanimity yeah, and a sense of humility. An excellent point, especially on, on, on the death of someone whom, again, you obviously had problems with. But, let me finish my thought. Yeah. Rand dies, the first sentence of his obituary of Rand. Ayn Rand is dead, and so is the movement she brought forward, it, or the, her philosophy. It was, in fact, stillborn. To use that as a metaphor, to take a dig at someone, yeah. you're pro-life, someone who just died, her body's still warm, you are as vile as it gets. And if a leftist did this... Oh, we'd never hear the end of it. 
But because, oh, I'm conservative, I'm the, you know what I mean? Like, get the hell out of here. Yeah, we'd be, we'd be lectured to about what, this boorish behavior from the left and it's typical coming from Correctly. The, yeah. And that, that, that leftist would be lectured correctly. Whereas if you ever watched um, the, 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 the editor and publisher of Random House, Bennett Cerf, oh, yes. who was a left liberal... Loved his, Rand of his day. Published Atlas Shrugged. Yeah, had great respect for her. He's and and he said nothing but kind things about her, uh, but also just the way he behaved in public, dignified, gentlemanly, kind, benevolent. The exact opposite of that nasty sob. Yeah, the there's two great Bennett Surf stories. One is Rand when she submitted her ma manuscript for Atlas Shrugged, she was accused. He had some edits for her, and she was accused of saying, "Would you cut the Bible?" And when someone asked her about this, she goes, I never said that. I never would say that. The Bible needs cutting. So, that was, so she had her wit about her. Okay. Um, and what was my... Oh, they had a falling out because as a follow-up to Atlas Shrugged, she wanted to do a nonfiction book. Right. The and first essay of which was The Fascist New Frontier comparing JFK to Hitler. Yeah, and he was not going to allow that. And I think JFK had just been shot, and Ayn Rand in her autistic way was like, what's the difference does that make? And, and, but, right, and, but her view was, she said, look, you always told me I could write anything I wanted. He <laughs> yeah. said, yeah, in fiction. That's what we said about fiction. We did not say nonfiction. Yeah, his like his brains are on the floor, and you're like, here's my essay. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, maybe a little, just, <laughs> you know. So that was and that essay was hard to find for a long time, uh, but thanks to the internet, everything's now. Available. If you watch the old show, which you can find all the episodes of uh, What's My Line from the '50s, and you see Bennett surf on almost every episode, and he's just he exudes what it means to be a gentleman. And he was, as I say, he was like a standard left liberal guy in his day and age. The, I, I venture to say there is no, there's nobody like that even on the right. Oh, yeah. Nobody who even remotely approaches that guy. It was very funny because when I was doing Ego and Hubris, that was Random House, Valentine. And my editor at the time was like, you know, Ben is Surf's assistant like was still here and he'd wander the halls. You'd be like, oh, my God. Like, oh, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, tell us what it was like yeah, back exactly. in the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I would like to thank my guest, Tom Woods, so much uh, for being such a good friend and for being my guest again. I'm a guest on your show all the time. We're going to have some fun now in New York at his daughter's expense. I will see you all next week. You are welcome. All right, everybody, that's it. Now, coming up, I don't know the exact day this will be happening, which episode number, but we're going to be having a debate on tariffs and on the Trump tariffs in particular we're going to be talking to Gene Epstein, formerly of Barron's, and Dan McCarthy, who's been a guest a number of times on the show, just had an article in the New York Times on this exact topic, and who has been in the Buchananite wing of the world for some time, and they're going to just hash it out, and I think we're going to learn a lot from that. So some fun stuff coming up. Make sure and keep on listening. You don't want to miss that one or any of these other precious gems coming at you every single weekday. Thanks for listening. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.